Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome especially to some of our visitors today. For all of you visiting with us out there on the Internet, welcome to you as well, and hope you'll be back soon. Uh, you know, when we come away from the feast, sometimes we bring certain feelings, certain thoughts, certain messages that have especially appealed to us. And this year at the feast was no exception for me. I usually come away with a central feeling that I get from the feast. It may not be the same as you might have gotten or that maybe even the preparers planned to be if they'd planned one. But back in 2004, I was diagnosed with a cataract in my left eye. And shortly after that, the right eye was well. But anyway, they did surgery on that to correct that. But a little bit later that same year, I had a complete vitreous collapse in that same left eye and had to have laser retina surgery to prevent the possibility of a detached retina. That was scary at first, but actually laser surgery is no big deal. You get a big flash in your eye for a few times, and it's over and done with. No pain, no, you know, they say no pain, no gain. I had no pain, but I had gain, so I guess it worked out. But I'm like a lot of you probably. I have worn glasses since I was in junior high school. Um, now that I had the cataract surgery, I don't need to wear them when I'm looking back there in the back. I can see everybody, but I can't see my notes, so I have to keep them on. <clears throat> I did that primarily because in hunting, if you have glasses and you're at high altitude or something, or even if you're not at high altitude and you're going fast to try to do something, all of a sudden your glasses fog up, you can't see diddly. And you look through your scope and it's, you know, it's nothing but a fog. So that was one of the reasons I did that. The way I discovered that I needed glasses is I was at a football game with several of my friends. We were sitting in the end zone, and we were messing around just talking, playing, and everything. And one of the guys wore glasses. So I asked him, let me borrow his glasses. He did. I put them on. I said, oh, is this what it's supposed to look like? <laughs> I mean, because it was, before that, it was, I could see figures and images, but I couldn't read any numbers or anything else. So I have been wearing glasses ever since. I'm nearsighted. As some of you probably are as well. But I also suffer right along with much of the world with another form of nearsightedness which sometimes causes each of us to have maybe to live a life that's a little more self-centered than it ought to be, to sometimes have difficulty in seeing past our own, in many cases, especially for those of us that live in the United States, our affluent and somewhat complacent existence. Sometimes we find ourselves apathetic and even impervious and even indifferent to the world around us. Oh, I think most of us are familiar with all the statistics that we've all read. I'm not sure the latest ones. These are the ones I came up with. But they say one billion people will go to bed tonight hungry. That may be an, an underestimate. It may be an overestimate. I don't know. But it's one of the, the statistics I came up with. And the reason for that in most cases is there are millions of homeless people. They're homeless because of war. They're homeless because of famine earthquakes, hurricanes. Look what uh, Maria did in Puerto Rico. I don't know how, what the current statistics are over there, how many people are still homeless, but it's a lot. It may be a year before some of them ever even have power again. And there's just hunger. There's all kinds of difficulties everywhere. Now, even in the United States, you know, we've got thousands of people who are homeless. I remember years ago when I was in Washington, D.C., I had a meeting with the uh, Internal Revenue Service up there, had an issue to discuss with them for a client. And uh, in going to the building, there are a lot of these, and I don't know what you call them because um, we don't have them around here, where you walk by and there's heat coming up out of a grate. My wife is raising, shaking her head. She knows what I'm talking about. She's from Chicago. The bigger cities, I think, have them. There were lots of people grouped around those that were homeless, but there was heat for them that was coming up out of that grate. It's not because of war that our people are homeless in the United States. When was the last time we had a war on this, you know, other than the war of attrition, the war on drugs and things like this? Uh, it's been a long time. Hurricanes have upset a bunch of people, Irma, Harvey, Katrina, years gone past, and have caused difficulty for them as well. But for the most part, our people are not homeless as a result of those kinds of natural disasters. It's primarily because of the lives that they live. It's a very convoluted life at times. It's a tortured life of abuse, of perversion, 
of exploitation of people. But there are billions of people around this world, some of whom are Muslims, Muslims, or they, they, maybe they live in India or in China or any other country. They do not know Jesus Christ. They do not know who he is or what he has done. Not to mention the millions also in the United States in the same situation. Now, st- statistics like this can sometimes make us feel guilty and say, you know, we need to do more, at least for a little while. Then, unfortunately, for too many of us, the feeling is temporary. We go on our way merrily, doing what it is we were doing before that feeling came upon us. Sometimes we revert back to our, in effect, narrow-minded, myopic vision. But, you know, we can sometimes also develop a very type of obtuse intolerance to the plight of the world around us. And sometimes we can just, you know, forget about the things that we are bothering us like that because... We don't deal with them on a daily basis. We read them in the newspapers. We hear them on the newscast. But we don't live them in that sense of the word. There's a scripture found over in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. When Christ was describing some of the people, he says, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What do you suppose it would take for all of us to develop the kind of heart that truly cares for other people, cares for their needs, cares for their, you know, things that they need in their life? There's another scripture found over in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14 where Paul amplified this even a little bit further when he said, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that is something I think everybody in this room strives to accomplish. Everyone listening to us, hopefully, on the Internet as well. But just, you know, thinking about it, how well have we carried that out? How well have we performed in that particular area? On page 134 of our hymnal, I'm not sure I didn't look to see. Yep. Dave's got it as a closing hymnal. Page 134. It's taken from Isaiah chapter 6. After God asked the question in verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 6, when he says, Whom shall I send? There follows that very famous refrain from the song where it says, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. And then the statement that I named this particular message after, I will go, Lord. I will go. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Strong, strong message. Beautiful song as well. And I think this verse, as much as any, has been used by many because of when they hear it as an exhortation to do, to do more, to witness, to serve, to do the things that we know we should be doing. But have you ever really looked up in the book of Isaiah what was going on at this particular time? What happened as a result of Isaiah, you know, bringing this point forward? In um, the situation we're looking at, it was not simply Isaiah expressing the thought that he or others, you know, could do much by themselves. He's not saying, you know, we can go out and do all these things that we need to do. It didn't come from some great compassion that was swelling up inside of Isaiah, that he you know, regarded the needs of the world around him. He saw them. He knew something needed to be done. And I think we see that in order to have a world vision, we must first start with coming to a vision of who God really is. In Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to be there in a while, in a few minutes, but you don't have to turn there right now, the king, Uzzah, has been king of Judah for over 50 years. That's a pretty long time in anybody's estimation. And most of the kings, some of them served one day. But Uzzah was one of those that served for an extremely long time. Judah is in transition, and it's in total upheaval. Turn over, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 5 to sort of set the stage of where we are at this particular time in history and what's going on. Isaiah chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 13. It says, Therefore my people 
have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, their multitude dried up with thirst, and therefore Sheol, or the grave, has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Thousands are died, have died. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of the host shall be exalted in judgment. And then it says, And God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. In spite of all the turmoil that was going on, in spite of all the trouble, all the difficulty, Isaiah, in verse 16, he said, He saw God who is holy. He shall be exalted or he shall be hallowed in righteousness. Skip down now if you would to verse 20 in Isaiah chapter 5. And it says in verse 20, What sorrows for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and that light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Does that sound anything like some of the things going on in the news today? Isaiah was an old guy. He's a long time ago. How's he writing about our news today? Well, the same thing happens today as was happening then. Just a little bit different scenario. Maybe reported on in a little bit different way. But going on in verse 21, it says, What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes. Well, we don't see that on television much nowadays, do we? And think themselves so clever. Then Isaiah envisioned, after this, I'm skipping down then to the beginning of chapter 6. Isaiah sees God on his throne. Beginning in chapter 6, in verse 1. In the year that King Uzzah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled, with, filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then Isaiah, going on, declares his own sins and his own weaknesses, beginning in verse 5. So he said, So I said, Woe is me, for I am unclean. I am undone, <clears throat> because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He then switches on down into verse 6, and he is then cleaned, as it were. In verse 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sins purged. Then follows that famous line in verse 8. And God says, Whom shall I send? Who is going to go? You know, just as Isaiah recognized his own shortcomings, he was reminded of the fact of God's majesty, of God's holiness. He was given a job to do, and he recognized that he couldn't do it alone. He couldn't do it by himself. He didn't have the ability, the effort to do it. During the feast, as I said, I often sort of come away with a singular thought, and this is what I came away with. When God calls, are we going to answer? Are we going to answer God and saying that we will go? I will go, Lord. What is it you have you want me to do? Because, you know, if we listen hard enough, we will hear him call. Too often we let our myopia, though, you know, cloud our vision. In verse 3 here, we see again in Isaiah's words, he said that God has a worldview when he said the whole earth is full of his glory. God's not concerned just about this congregation of the Church of God International or just the churches of God. He's concerned about the whole world, the whole earth it is full of his glory. God is still on his throne in spite of all the turmoil, all the transition, all the difficulty, the power 
munglings that people are going through trying to say who's the best and who's the, you know, the greatest, who's the biggest, and everything else we see. And it can't help but remind me of God's discourse with Job in chapter 38 and verse 4. You don't necessarily need to turn there. I'll read it for you. It says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Remember that? Where were you? Job didn't have an answer. I don't think any of us do either. There's another admonition found over in 1 John, if you want to turn there. 1 John chapter 1. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You know, I have actually had people, not many, but people tell me, I don't have anything to repent of. The only comeback I have for something like that is when you do it and you you want to be careful, you're not trying to run somebody away or, you know, hurt them. There's the first sin right there. If nothing else, it goes on to say, if we confess our sins in verse nine, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say in verse 10 that we have not sinned, we make him a liar And his word is not in us. There's another scripture then following. And over in Isaiah chapter 64, beginning of verse 6, it's very similar to this as well. It adds a little bit more to it. Speaking in Isaiah's words again. But we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calls upon your name, that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hid your face from us, and you have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, but now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. This sound familiar? We are the clay. You are the potter. And we are all the work of your hand. You know, we're all the same to God. He wants us all to participate. He wants us all to give of what we have to give. How many of you are Star Wars fans? You remember anybody in the Star Wars called Jabba the Hutt? How can you forget him? If you've seen him once, you never forget him. You see him maybe in your nightmares. The thing about Jabba the Hutt is I never saw him move. He just sat there, laid there, did whatever he did there. Um, But you know, and I don't mean this too disrespectfully, I think too many people see God sort of like Jabba the Hutt. He's sitting on his throne. Is he helpless to do anything? Or is he just unable? Or is he unwilling? When we don't see the things that we want done in our lives or in somebody else's life or changes that need to be made, we think God is weak. Maybe we don't express it in that same way. But have you ever had any doubt whatsoever along that line? You know, it's God. Why is he not doing what he's supposed to be doing? According to our thinking, that's what he's supposed to be doing. I think we're all familiar with the verse over in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now, in this particular case, it is quoted to show that we should submit to worldly authority. But going on, there's a qualification, you might say. It says, for there is no power but of God. God allows it. We may not agree with it. You know, we don't agree with Osama bin Laden and all of the other dictators around the world that we've had that have terrified people, put nations into subjection. But there is no power but of God. God can use the worst of the lot to fulfill His purpose. The powers that be are ordained of God And we should be reminded again of a scripture over in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 when it says, let your conversation, in effect, your conduct, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper And I will not fear what man could do or shall do. Do we remember that every time we come into difficulties and troubles that God has promised? He who cannot lie, who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, 
I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And you need not fear what man shall do. The Lord is my helper. You know, if we attempt to go into this world as we have been commanded to do, you're familiar with the scripture in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 where it says, Go you therefore and teach all nations. Without the vision of God as our foundation, we can be overwhelmed. We can become discouraged. We might even revert back to our apathy and the myopia of our life. Isaiah's vision was not there just to get him to look up to God for strength and for the power that he needed from God. It was not just to get him to expand his own view, of, to make it a worldview, but to also, as we should do, to look inward at ourselves. Isaiah pronounced so much gloom and doom. If you've read through Isaiah and you're familiar with it, every chapter seems to begin with, Woe unto them. And then he goes on to whatever that particular woe is. Woe unto them that do this, and woe is unto them that do that. But you know, we saw in this verse, in verse 5, we saw him cry in verse 5, Woe is me. Woe is me. Has that too often been the cry, maybe, of even some of us? Woe is me. I'm not capable. I can't do that. I'm not qualified. I don't have the ability to do that. And you know, in one sense of the word, all that's true. We don't. But God does. God can. He's our helper. He's our strength. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Don't forget, as we see in the Bible, how we are described, how we are are mentioned. It is used in the words called, and elect. You are God's called. You are God's elect. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 is just one of the many scriptures, but it says, put on therefore as the elect of God. How does that differentiate you from somebody walking the streets out here? Somebody over in India who's never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Now, were we called because we're something special? It says he calls the weak of the world. I take solace in that sometimes, and sometimes I say, yeah, you're right. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering." You know, Isaiah, one of his main strengths was his ability to speak, his speaking But he said, I am a man of unclean lips. And again, all of us have sinned. Romans 3, chapter chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. All have sinned. It doesn't say except for so and so. We all have read and know, familiar with the stories of Moses, of Abraham, of David, of Job, Paul. You could keep naming them, just to name a few, and all that they went through. They are all, they were all, inadequate. As the Scripture says, their righteousness was as filthy rags, unqualified sinners. But they all accomplished the job God gave them to do through God's power and strength in each one of them. They relied upon God. They let Him be the power behind the throne, as it were. Over in Romans chapter 12, if you want to turn over there for a moment. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, we see all the sacrifices that the people had to go through and the difficulties that was. But we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may then prove what is that good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. 
For we have many members right here today in one body. All members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Goes on to say then in verse 6, having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us. I don't know what your gift is. I'm still trying to figure out mine. But we are to submit them, as it were, unto God, be utilized in his service. That's what we've been called for. I've said before and I'll repeat it again. God did not call us to save us. He called us to use us up. When he says, who will go? How will we answer? What is your gift? There's a couple of scriptures I want just to read to you to sort of give you a, a general idea of something. In Acts chapter 10, verse 30, you may be remember, familiar with this, the situation. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard, and your alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. I gave a couple of messages back over the last several months concerning prayer. It says, Cornelius, your prayer was heard. Cornelius didn't think it had been. And the alms that you have given are in remembrance in the sight of God. God remembers them. You think we don't? He doesn't sometimes. But God hears our prayers. And the alms that we give, the things that we do, they're in His sight. He knows about them. Scripture over in James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from this world. So here's five things right here that all of us can easily do. There's prayer, the giving of alms, visit the fatherless, visit the widows, and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Introspectively, how are we doing? You know, we all have our own situations, our own things that we need to work with. To do what God wants us to do, we cannot depend just on our own power, our own natural abilities. But at the same time, we cannot deny the gifts that God has given to us. We come each and every day as a sinner, but clean by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and transformed by the daily renewing of our mind, as it says in the Scriptures, through our prayer and our meditation in our Bible study. We continue to renew that that we have. And I need it every day. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, another scripture that's very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, seven, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfected, or it says perfect, but perfected, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. Furnished means equipped. That we are thoroughly equipped unto the good works He wants us to do. I don't care who you are. I care how old you are, how young you are, what your status in life is, with your poorest person on the face of the earth or the richest, and everybody in between. God has given us gifts. He's given us natural abilities. He's given us talents. He's called us for a reason. He's called us to do something. But we... We're like Isaiah. We're unclean people. We have unclean lips too. We live in an unclean world. I don't think that's something anybody will question me on on that particular statement. And a world of unclean lips. But God has not changed. The scriptures again tell us He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is still holy. He is still all-powerful. He still fills the universe. But too often... Sometimes you and I become a little too self-centered, maybe too nearsighted with our myopia, sometimes too complacent in the times that we live, and maybe even too afraid. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50. And I'm going to begin verse 1. Thus saith the Lord. Verse 2 says, Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? In my hand, <clears throat> is my hand, I'm sorry, shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Have I no power 
to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. The Lord God, in verse 4, has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakes morning by morning. He wakes mine ear to hear as, he, as the learned. The Lord God has opened mine ear, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near unto me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is among you that fears the Lord? Who is among you that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust then in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. God has always given us and will always give us everything we need to accomplish his will. So when God once again says, whom shall I send? Who will answer? I will go, Lord. 